guys. Welcome to Unmasked. I'm Vanessa. I'm so excited about our guest tonight. She's an author, an Emmy-nominated crime correspondent for The Dr. Oz Show, and the daughter of the notorious happy face killer Keith Jesperson, who was a truck driver slash serial killer in the 1990s. So let's bring on Melissa Moore. Hey, Melissa. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks so much for being here tonight. Uh, well, I'm excited. I know that you have some questions and I'm here to answer them. And I'm just excited to get to know you and, and your group of people. And yeah, I'm here to have a, a good time and talk about whatever. Nothing's off limits. So let's, let's okay. dive in. <laughs> We've already had a ton of questions. We asked some of the members in advance. So I do have a big old list of questions for you, but for everyone watching, um, we'll go over this at the end too, but Melissa's podcast is called life after happy face. And she has some books that are uh, linked in the description below. So one of the first things I wanted to ask you, I mean, I have so many things, but the thing I was thinking about when I was, we were binge watching you over the weekend was most of the time, we get to hear the perspective of the victim's families and how devastating it's been, you know, after the murder of their loved ones. We don't really get to hear the effects and insights from the killer side of the family, even though I'm sure it's just as life altering. Do, why do you think that is? Do you think there's a stigma as far as that goes or? Yeah, it's very difficult to interject and start sharing what your experience is when people have lost their lives and you're still alive. So it never feels appropriate to interject when, you know, national media is happening. Um, so that's what I find to be the number one cause or reason why family members don't speak out. And the second reason is there's this accusatory blame that comes with being the family member of a killer the number one thing I hear and that other family members hear is um, you, you obviously knew. How do you not know that this was happening? And mm -hmm. so, I mean, we can obviously answer that and family members are happy to answer that. And I'm not going to speak about, you know, the, the laundry case, the Gabby case, because that seems to be a very different situation that's going on. I'm, and I'm not privy to that case. I'm at work with their, with the laundry family. So I can't share about their silence, but most breaking cases that I've worked on, it's because the media is focused on the victims. And if the perpetrator's family starts speaking out, then they're, then it, 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 it seems like they're saying that I don't, I don't want, we just don't want people to compare our pain because they're not the same. It's a different a loss and grief than it is to lose, to lose your life or lose someone you love, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, I personally think that, you know, what you're doing offers, you know, like I said, a unique and kind of invaluable insight for others. So what made you decide to take everything that you've experienced? Because I'm sure that was very traumatic and kind of use it for good. Yeah, it's actually my daughter <laughs> that inspired me when she was little. So what ended up happening, for those who aren't familiar with my case or haven't listened to Happy Face, the podcast, was in 1995, my father was arrested and I was in high school. And so instantly that was like you hear the saying, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree or it's genetic, like what's wrong with her? Because, you know, that's what people would say. So I instantly felt ashamed I hid, I kept it a secret until I had a family of my own. And then my daughter was learning about families and they were doing this family tree. And she started to realize that parents have parents. And so she knew my mom, but she didn't know who my dad was. And so she asked that question and I didn't, she asked like everybody has a dad, where's your dad? And she's like five or six, you know, very beginning of elementary school. And I realized that one day closer than what I hoped, I would have to explain who her grandfather is. And then shortly after that, what ended up happening is there was another serial killer in Spokane, Washington, Robert Yates and his family, he had a family and he actually buried one of the victims in their yard. And 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the, so they ended up removing the family from the family home and they were excavating and they were finding, they found, you know, a victim's body right outside the daughter's bedroom window. And so the news was breaking and then these young ladies were the same age as me. And I wanted to reach out and say, you're not alone. You know, that what you're experiencing is absolutely bizarre and unique but sadly, you know, you're not alone in this experience. And so that w that's what got me coming to the point where I need to share my story and reach out to other people like me. Little did I know then, I thought it was going to be like 20 people, but it ended up being hundreds of people, not just serial killers, but killers in general too, you know? Hmm. Well, and I realize you actually brought this up just a minute ago. So everyone watching has kind of varying levels of knowledge on this case and on your dad's case. So could you walk us through kind of growing up with your dad and how you describe your relationship? Yeah. Um, so growing up, I thought I had a really normal life. We lived rural Washington. My mom was a stay at home mom. I, I'm the oldest of three siblings. My dad would leave, uh, he actually, um, he, so before he was a truck driver, he was a welder and he was, um, also an entrepreneur. He was a, he was a, um, real estate investor. A lot of people, we never really talk about his other careers because the truck driver career seemed to be the most notorious aspect of his career choice. Um, but he, so he ended up being a long haul truck driver and, that's when he would meet with different women and he started assaulting that we know of um, women when my parents got a divorce, but he was obviously, he's very unfaithful to my mom during their marriage. And I think in, in most cases, when I work with perpetrators or serial killer families, I notice that um, the perpetrator picks out a life partner that doesn't have the means to really be empowered. Like my mother came from a broken home. She had an alcoholic father. My mom was just wanting to get out of the house. And my dad came from a successful family. And, and then she quickly had children and she didn't have a college education. So she didn't, she didn't really rock. She didn't rock the boat, you know, when all of his infidelities occurred. And, um, so anyway, so going forward, my dad had mistresses and then they were married for about, I think it was 13 years when my dad asked for a divorce and we moved to Spokane and then he moved his mistress into our home. And I thought that was the worst of it as a, as a kid, leaving everything behind and then his girlfriend's family taking over our once upon a time life. But now looking back at what it's, you know, there's a silver lining to everything. And mm -hmm. um, then his girlfriend and him had difficulties. Uh, he ended up moving to Portland into their family house, her family house. And that's when he killed uh, Tanya Bennett was around winter time. And his girlfriend was away from home. And um, yeah, that was the summer home I would go to with my dad. And I talk about in Happy Face, uh, the podcast. So if you want a more detail, you know, version of this story, it's definitely on season one of Happy Face. I cover it all. Talk about how haunted the house was, what happened, and then meeting with my dad's victims, family members, and covering his case in a little bit more detail. But but ultimately, he was captured in 1995. My uncle turned in a letter that my dad wrote, a suicide letter that he wrote saying that he's truly the black sheep of the family. He's killed eight women, assaulted more. And then my uncle turned it in. And then he eventually was tried for Tanya Bennett and his final victim, Julie Winningham. And then it all came out that he was a serial killer. Um, the smiley face though aspect, just to put, you know, a summary to why he was called the happy face is mm -hmm. that after his first murder, Tanya Bennett, he um, went about his life, but an, a lady named Laverne, Par uh, Laverne Pavlinak came forward and said her boyfriend did the murder. It was just on 2020. So that that's, you know, they covered her side of the family and why she did this, why she came forward. But she accused her boyfriend of killing Tanya Bennett. 
she was convincing enough that they were both tried and sentenced to jail. And then my dad started writing letters to the media, giving clues that the real killer was out there and, and then signing it with a happy face. So mm -hmm. hence the happy face killer. So I just want to back up for just a minute. When, when they got divorced, how old were you at that time? Uh, 10 years old. 10. Okay. Yeah. 1990. Yep. So then before that, did you have good memories that you could kind of pull from? Were there good times that you can remember with your dad? Yeah. Uh, my dad was really athletic and he was a cyclist. And so he would spend time with us kids. He built before there was the before there was that bike um, attachment that you put your kids in it, the trolley thing that you attach to your bike. He There wasn't that back in the... Um, early days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was born in, in the seventies. So he actually welded one together and made his own buggy for us kids to sit in while he rode his bike. And so we, we'd go cycling with him and then he took us camping. He took us on trips. Uh, he was very hands-on. Yeah. He was a, he was really jolly, fun, charismatic, Everywhere we went, he was, you know, tall. He stood out. People had conversation with him. He's flirtatious um, to the point where it is her sexual harassment. But, he was, yeah. you know, he was a unique guy and he had friends and he, had, he seemed normal, you know. So one of our members had a question. I mean, all of this, of course, is hindsight. And looking back, was there ever a time you could remember that you felt, you know, that scared or that he could hurt you or your siblings? Yeah, it, I had this really strange experience um, that I couldn't logically at the time um, really explain. But now, as you, you know, you said hindsight's 2020. So mm -hmm. there is this moment after my parents got a divorce, we, we were living in my grandmother's basement. It was unfinished and it, it was really a horrible situation. The, I mean, we're just basically like this close to being on the streets. And um, it was, uh, it was, I was sleeping on a cot and like had shoe boxes for my clothes. It was really dire. It was not a great circumstance. So I go to school and I would take the school bus. And on the way home, I would always look out the window at other people's houses and dream of one day having a house again, you know, like my home was taken away. And, and so I came home and I asked my mom, like, what, what does it require for us to get a home? And she said, I can only afford $400 a month for rent. So good. Like we're not going to get a place. So then one day I saw this sign and this uh, landlord was sitting in the front yard, like hammering a for rent sign in the front yard. And I jumped off the bus and I went and talked to the landlord and I said, Hey, how much are you going to rent this place for? He's like, why are you asking? I'm like sixth grade. And he's, and he's like, why are you asking me? I'm like, my mom and I, we, you know, we need a house. And he's like, will you bring your mom over here? And at this point, my mom and dad were divorced and, um, and we were just really destitute. And so my mom walked over there and he's like, ma'am, how much can you afford? She's like, I can only afford 400. It's yours. So we move in. And then, so right after we move in, um, I want to say it's like two weeks after we move into this house, my dad makes an appearance unannounced. And I don't know this. I feel sick. I'm staying home from school. I get this premonition, this intuition that tells me, lock all the windows, lock the door now. And that's before my dad pulls up. So I, I listen to my intuition. I lock all the windows. I lock all the doors. Mind you, this is my first time home alone in this house. It's a new house. And I'm thinking I'm just being paranoid. You know, I'm scared. I'm a sixth grader scared of being home alone. I feel sick. So I lock it all. And then I hear, um, the truck pull up in the gravel and then something tells me don't, don't look through the door, stay like hide under the blanket on the couch. And so I hide under the blanket on the couch and I hear the doorknob rattle and like some knocking. And then I hear some footsteps shuffling to the windows and then trying to open it. 
And then I see, then I hear like footsteps kind of going back to the vehicle, the vehicle door shutting. And then um, once I feel like it's safe to peek to see who it was, I see that's my dad. Now there was this moment that I could have stopped him and opened up the door and said, Hey dad, I'm here. You know, like maybe that's probably what a normal kid would do if their dad showed up, but something just told me to, to not do that. And then from that point forward, I started to think that there's something wrong with me. Like, why do I feel so uneasy with my dad? And that was the first premonition intuition experience that I had. And then I had more after that, but that one would be, that one was definitely memorable for me. That's so interesting. Cause I think back to myself at that age and you don't, there's no way you would ever think that. So, so yeah, that was just your, I guess, you know, instincts with the little, you know, warning light there. And it, it is interesting. Cause I heard you had an interesting story about, well, a couple of them, but the one I was thinking of in particular was when you were in the car and I don't know how old you were in the story. You'll have to tell me, but you were in his car with him and you guys were driving maybe to a camping site and he actually drove you by the Columbia Gorge. I believe it was where Tanya Bennett had been. I think it was there. And yeah. Then- and it was, um, what ended up happening is I was in the front passenger seat next to my dad and he, the song, um, I left her by the river. I think it was, who sings that? I swear I left her by the river. I swear I left her safe and sound. I don't even know who sings that song, but I remember the lyrics because my dad started bolting, like just singing this song. And he's not somebody to sing, but I felt like he was trying to say something, but he was, it's a song about a woman that was murdered and the husband's being, the boyfriend's being blamed. And so that's what the song is about. And then after that song is done, he says, I know how to kill someone and get away with it. I would cut her, her button fly off, you know, her buttons off her jeans. So my fingerprints couldn't be on it. I would um, wear my cycling shoes so that they couldn't see my sole imprint and know what size. So that was one of the, one of the creepy experiences too, you know, growing up. Yeah. When I was listening to that one or hearing you talk about it, it gave me the chills. That was just, cause I don't know how you would process that. Was that just one of those moments where you thought, well, this is a weird conversation. And then, yeah, I think at this point I was 12 or 13, you know, mm-hmm. still really young. And I think what the general idea of being a preteen girl is that I definitely got told I was overdramatic. I got told I'm emotional. I'm sensitive. I got told that I'm a drama queen. (laughs) Like, so, you know, these are labels that were placed on me. And I think that a lot of girls get these labels. And so it, it silenced me from really saying too much, you know, it really did. It got me to the point where I'm like, Oh, am I being overdramatic? (laughs) <laughs> you know, by, by saying this. And then what am I going to prove? He said he knows how to kill someone. And what if I'm making this into a bigger deal than what it is? You know, I'm 13. No one's going to believe me. Right. Mm. I can completely see that. Jax asks, um, how have your siblings dealt with the aftermath of everything um, that they found out about your dad? Well, my siblings are really private, but they're remarkable people. Um, my, uh, my sister, she was an ER nurse. She just, she just stopped, um, like a month ago and she's running a business and a very successful business. And she does day trading and she's a fabulous lady. She has kids. Um, she's an incredible mother, compassionate person. Um, very strong. If you know any ER nurses, you know that (laughs) <laughs> there, I would say like when it comes to my sister and me, I was a storyteller, probably more the, I, I don't know, but my sister was definitely the tomboy and, <laughs> and she's super strong. She's amazing. And then my brother, he went into the military. He served for a couple of wars and uh, he's still in the military service. He's very private. He has a family and I mean, this is something that we just don't, 
we don't really talk about like we don't need to talk about it anymore because it's so long ago. We each had our own experiences with our dad, but none of them talked to my dad, you know, mm -hmm. none of us, none of us talked to him, you know? So, uh, okay. Sammy wants to know about the spaghetti sauce on the ceiling. Hmm. Yeah. That was the Portland house, um, on Everett. And what happened with that is that's where Tanya Bennett was murdered in the living room. I didn't know this. So what ended up happening is that one of the first nights that I slept in my dad's house there, I um, couldn't sleep because of a paranormal experience I was having, which is in the podcast that I talk about happy face. Um, I go and lay on the couch and I look up on the ceiling and there's red splatter all over the ceiling, like speckles of it. And of course, when you see something like that, you want to look and, and find out like your mind wants to process, like, what is this? And so I came to the, the conclusion that's probably spaghetti sauce somehow, because it was the mm -hmm. same kind of splatter that a spray that would look like spaghetti if you've ever like exploded sauce, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, that's how this, the, how it was is just, it was yeah. so random and out like the way it was sprayed out. So that's why I thought it was spaghetti sauce, but then I've come to realize that it was not, it was just a place that he forgot to clean up after the murder of Tanya. So, so about Tanya's murder. So for those of you who don't know, that was January. I think it was the 23rd. Correct me if I'm wrong. January um, of 1990. And at your age, I mean, did you know that she had gone missing and had been found at the time? Were you aware of any of this? Back then? There was um, reports about her missing, but I, I was so young and in my own world, you know, I wasn't really paying attention to true crime. The, when I was young, young, my dad and I would actually sit and watch um, Unsolved Mysteries together. And and I was obsessed with that show. It was, which is so weird now to think back that I would sit on his shoulders and I would brush his hair and put, I had these barrettes, like little plastic barrettes. I would put his hair in little barrettes and watch Unsolved Mysteries. <laughs> so weird. <laughs> that now looking back, like that's not really something. <laughs> it doesn't sure seem that would be weird. <laughs> thinking about that with everything now. Yeah. Yeah. Now looking back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that is weird too, just to think about the dichotomy of your dad. I mean, on one end, he's taking you, you know, he's sitting there putting brats in your hair, watching TV shows and going camping and then this other side. So I am, I'm sure that is really hard to, or at yeah. least it was maybe have I not wrap your mind around. Yeah, it was, it was pretty, pretty crazy. I, you know, it'd be amazing if I could have had a normal childhood to see the, to have a different frame of reference, but you know, that's, that's what I had. And so what I thought was normal, really wasn't normal in any way, but it looked normal on the outside. So are, are you, are they positive that Tanya was his first victim? Um, no, they're not positive about that. So we, when it comes to his victims, he's open about some of them and closed about others. I do know that he assaulted a lot more women prior to Tanya Bennett. One of them was um, uh, Don Slagle that survived. And as you know, studying serial killers that learning how to kill takes time to develop for them to get their MO, to perfect their kill. And so some of them change weapons, some of them change motive, like how they're not motive, but um, change how they, they kill either they'll do it in controlled environments or they'll take certain tools, like a cool, uh, a kill kit to the site. They pick their victims very strategically, but that comes from all trial and error as they build up. And so there's survivors normally at the beginning until they come up with a, routine or a, a plan that works for them. Mm -hmm. So then as far as the, as 
Tanya Bennett goes, for those of you who don't know, after she was killed, um, a woman named Laverne Pavlinak came forward and actually implicated her boyfriend as being the one who killed her. It's just, it, and this is why I think so many people are fascinated too with this story, mm -hmm. is that she came forward, implicated him. I mean, you know, I know she had a couple different versions of the story, but they ended up being convicted. Right. And when my father was arrested, I think what really shocked me is that they weren't immediately released. It still took mm -hmm. a long time for them to be released. Yeah. I saw that. That is, that is mm -hmm. really strange to me because they did serve, wasn't it um, five, five years? years? Yeah. Five years. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's unbelievable. So mm -hmm. yeah. So for those of you who don't know that it, that's this weird twist to the story. And because of that, and if I understand correctly, the jury during the trial did not know that your dad was writing these letters, taking credit or the messages, correct? You know, I don't know much about it. I didn't end up watching the 2020 piece on it. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I know they dive deep into that aspect of my dad's case. Um, but I wasn't really privy to it. I think I knew more about the general about the other murders afterwards, um, mm -hmm. but not what really happened to Laverne and, and John. Like I didn't really, I didn't follow their, their story, you know, too much. Yeah. It's, it's really crazy because, you know, during the trial, even though he didn't do it, all they had to do was play the um, statements from the police and convince the jury. So they were convicted. He actually took a deal to avoid the death penalty and then that, you know, um, your dad was then able to go on and kill another seven women. So during that time, why do you think your dad would have written those letters? Um, even though other, you know, other people had taken the credit for it and he was almost kind of off the hook for Tanya Bennett's murder. Because he's a narcissist, he wanted the credit for it. Um, he wanted people to know that he was the killer and that he's a serial killer and he wanted credit. He believes killing was difficult. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do to kill somebody. And I think he, that made him feel superior to other people, that he was unique, grandiose, everything that we know about serial killers and their psyche, that was him. And so... And he got the media attention for it as well. And so that's why it continued. Mm -hmm. I think from a psychological standpoint, that's so fascinating that, you know, he basically, that's what I guess you'd think a lot of killers would be like, wow, I just got away with this. It's, there's no better scenario than someone coming forward, taking credit and getting convicted. But the urge for recognition is so strong that mm -hmm. they almost would self sabotage that's fascinating to yeah me. like the zodiac killer um there's so many of them that just keep you know yeah. they, they get away with it and like uh ramirez night stalker with the pentagram mm -hmm. like and uh you know it it's just it's mm -hmm. what they do they really want the yeah. the attention and during that time were you in regular contact with your dad you know with as far as visitation goes between 1990 and 95. Yeah. Um, we, my parents were divorced, so we had, they had a parenting plan. <laughs> so we were exchanged, you know, and, um, sorry, there's like this little fly in the house. We've had the door open. We're doing construction in our house. Mm -hmm. And so the door has been open all day. And so there's like a little fly. So that's what I'm swatting. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, they had a parenting plan. So we would, do this on and off visitation exchanges, sometimes bizarrely enough, you know, <laughs> like now looking back, I don't even know how my mom did this, but my dad would show up with his, the former mistress and, and show up and have his camper and they would, they would stay in the camper on my mom's property. I don't even know how my mom like allowed oh, that. Wow. Yeah. I don't even know. Yeah. Well, did you, during that time then, okay. So then, wow, it almost sounds like there, it was amicable. So, I mean, or they had to make, I'm sure your mom was doing whatever she could to have it that way for you guys. So 
Did you yeah. notice any changes in him during that time or anything weird? Look now looking back, uh, I guess. Yeah, looking back, um he was becoming more and more um reckless, more and more unfiltered. So whereas he seemed to want to be more in public settings, I should say. So he was just around women. He was becoming more and more unfiltered and saying very explicit mm -hmm. things to women, um, being crude, being more detailed about his, his sexual escapades with different women. Cause after that relationship ended with, with Roberta, his former mistress girlfriend, he went on a path where he was with multiple different women some of them are still alive. Um, I'm curious about some of them because they had children. I would meet some of their kids. So he had regular relationships and then he would solicit prostitutes. Some of those were victims. Um, yeah. So I didn't know that, you know, going into it, I just noticed he was really uh, unhinged. He was just not really kept like he just exuded something different you know, hmm. almost manic. Yeah. That's interesting. So yeah. um, one of the questions is why do you think that he never, you know, hurt or killed your mother? Well, I think it's just one of those rules that serial killers have that he explained that he had. Well, uh, well, first of all, I should backtrack rules that serial killers have that from working with multiple serial killers are very bizarre and weird. And they're individual to the serial killer. Like I didn't understand the logic that some of them have, but they put these like compartments of who's safe and who's not safe or why they don't kill this person, but they'll kill this person. And when it came to my dad, one of his rules was that he doesn't kill close to him. So he doesn't get caught. So if he killed my mom, that would have been close. They would have looked at my dad immediately because they were divorced. Mm -hmm. I mean, the husband always kills the girlfriend, the wife. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the number one place that they go. And he would have been front and center. Hmm. That's so interesting to me. What are some of the other rules you've come across then talking to these guys? Manson was weird. Uh, Manson was a vegetarian. And like, but he had all these other rituals that were, you know, just um, <laughs> sadistic to people. So mm -hmm. he had this tremendous amount of compassion for animals, yet for women um, and certain people of society, he had none. So it just, it's interesting, like people, serial killers, what range they have. And, you know, some people argue with me, Manson wasn't a serial killer, but he definitely was a killer in, or a psychopath in some regards. So. Yeah. so the next one is, uh, let's see, can you ask her? Okay. If she suffered from some kind of, did you, oops, sorry. I just cut out. Um, I don't know if that's from a show you've done or anything where that question is coming from. If you had, any kind of injuries as a child? Was that in a show? My father did. Oh, yeah. he did. So ask it. I'm sorry. I he 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 For a minute, I was like, I don't yeah. like that. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm with you now. <laughs> yeah. I don't think this question. I, so hold I, on. Yeah, I don't believe oh, I yeah. did. Um, yeah, but, like, oh, yeah, and then my father was uh, in high school and they in Canada, and they do this ropes course. Like it was 30 feet up and he fell and he injured his head and he ended up getting a settlement and that money from the school settlement, that lawsuit, my dad and my mom started a trailer park. <laughs> like he started a development, a trailer park development. And mm -hmm. that's when he got into real estate. Hmm. Yeah. So well, you talked about that on one of the shows that I watched and I watched so much stuff over uh, the weekend. I was, you talked about he was abused as a child, correct? Correct. Um, I don't know about anything, anything sexual, but he definitely was physically abused as a child and even as a teenager. 
And did you have any contact with his parents when you were growing up too? Or, or yeah, they were um, they were different to me. They were really actually lovely people. I never experienced any violence from them. Um, I that's why it was so shocking to hear that my dad lived this two different experiences. You know, one as a child and as a as a young adult, as a teenager, and then a very different experience with his dad when um, he got married, his dad seemed to turn his life around um, from drinking and abusing alcohol. Well, I think one of the final straws was that he took my dad's motorcycle and he was completely wasted and he trashed the bike and ended up in the hospital. And um, he had my dad go and remove the bike from the road. So the cops, when they investigate it, like they, he moved it so that it looked like it was an accident versus it was recklessness from alcohol, like get rid of all the alcohol bottles. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think part of that, my dad always being the scapegoat also is a point to why he was telling the media that he murdered Tanya Bennett is because he was always the scapegoat for my grandfather. But I don't think it was the solo reason. You know, I think it was his way of just speaking out and saying his truth. Mm-hmm. But definitely wanted the credit. I still was, I think it was a two a two prong thing. Well, and I'm sure you know this from everything you do too. But that does, um, you know, we you always look at patterns. And I'm fascinated with the childhoods, the and what happens. But you know, same with Night Stalker. He did have a head injury and he had abuse in his past. So it's it is interesting to go back and see if there's some of those same. I don't know you know, red flags there that lead to. Yeah, what- they, they absolutely uh, believe. Mm-hmm. Sorry, that's my ring. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, uh, yeah, I think that there's, well, there is a theory that it's a, a brain injury similar to what NFL players experience and they have those violent urges. And it's, mm-hmm. I think it's different though, because of how, much planning goes into how they pick their victims versus an outburst of violence, you know, like a snapped part of that. But, um, but I definitely think that there's something to look at there and they have been exploring the minds of killers. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, inmates, well, fortunately and unfortunately inmates have rights. And so they're, they're not really studied in a way that per se, maybe we need, that type of information. Like we, we, they have to consent to their organs being donated. They have to consent to testing and medication um, because we live in America and that's the rights that everybody has. And, And I mean, I don't know, I'm not saying I'm for or against any of this. I'm just stating the facts of what it is. That's just the way it is, is that inmates have to consent to studying, um, so if if my if if serial killers aren't consenting to it, then we're not really getting the intel that we need. Other than maybe if they're getting psychotherapy, but there's just not the budgets. People, the prisons don't have these budgets. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I could go on forever about that. I'm such a nerd, but the yeah. brain and all that stuff you're talking about, I find that fascinating. So, um, but yeah. So and about that. So, okay. He has some different maybe explanations or whatever you want to call them for why he might've done that. Mm -hmm. One of the things that he said was that, um, they got into some kind of altercation, correct. Uh, And then he had hit her and he was worried about her reporting him for hitting her. And that was why he said he actually killed Tanya Bennett. Is that correct? Yeah. He, he said, that's why that was his motive. Um, I mean, he definitely was looking for a victim that night. Whether to kill her, I don't think that was on his mind. I think rape was on his mind, but ultimately when murder happened in in the aftermath, I think that became a new thrill, a new high for him. And when sex and violence are intermingled, then I'm sure that became his normal for fantasy, you know, a sexual fantasy, and that gave him the additional urge to seek that out. And do you believe that I got this question a lot from people today Mm -hmm. too, 
do you believe that there were only eight victims or do you believe that there were more? I believe there are more because you said there's more when it comes to the assault. I don't know as far as murders, if there's more murders. Um, I think if there were, he would, he would be boasting about them and giving more details about them, but definitely sexual assaults for sure. Mm. What was the story with, because someone told me something I hadn't heard before with him um, claiming the 185. Was that an exaggeration that he just said once? And then where did that number come from? Yeah, that came from the beginning of the, when he was first arrested and started trial for uh, Julie Winningham's murder. Mm -hmm. And then once he started to confess to all these murders, the press were there all the time. And, and that's when you'll see him explaining that there was more murders during that press coverage to the press. And that's just to, I think that was just to get a, a rise, like just to get more attention and, and fame. Hmm. Uh, Mary Flynn asks, have you talked to the serial killers in jail or just their families? Uh, both. I talked to the killer and their families, family members. And you've reached out to some of the victims of your dad, right? Correct. I've spoken to some of the victims, family members mm -hmm. and uh, victims. And yeah, I've, I've met, uh, met with some of them. What's that experience been like for you? Um, some really good, some not so great. Um, I would say Don Finley was a really good experience to meet with him. And you can hear that experience on happy face, but that was a really mm -hmm. transformative meeting, a really transformative meeting for me. And, and then, uh, um, if you watch monster, my family, I had an experience with Tanya Bennett's sister, Michelle, that I would say it didn't, wasn't the same level. You know, it didn't, I think it, it really comes from the intention going into the space. And, and I think it's also just the um, impression that people get too, you know, it's, it, it's just like anybody who's to meet someone new is their first impression of you, what your, what they think your intentions are, what kind of person they think you are mm -hmm. versus if that's really who you are. You know, if they make their mind up that you're a certain type of person, then they're going to treat you that way and, you know, good or bad. But I think um, in the latter, I think she just had a perception of who I was that didn't match up. The facts didn't match up with what, what my real life is, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ocean's Eleven Eleven. I was actually just going to ask her that. Um have you seen the new Netflix series, Catching a Killer? The last two episodes are about mm -hmm. your dad. It just came out. So. No way, really? <laughs> I had no idea. It's called, what is it called? Catching a Killer? Catching a Killer. I was going to link it in the description too. And it's four episodes total. Mm -hmm. And um, I've watched it. I got through most of it. And the last two of the four are about um, Happy Face Killer. Oh, no way. Okay. I'll watch it on Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, I didn't participate in that. I don't know. <laughs> like, yeah. I think that's one thing um, that I have been accused of is that I'm the one that keeps my dad in the press, but it really isn't the case. What we were talking about before we you know, started this is that started this video um, is that why I stepped forward and started speaking is because this was going on way before I even started speaking. My father had the floor. He could spill out his narrative, his propaganda. He could share whatever he wanted to share and nobody was fact checking him or calling him out. And so for a long time, I just accepted that maybe it's better just not to say anything you know, just follow that golden rule. It's better to say nothing at all if you have nothing good to say. And so I just stayed back. And then um, I finally had enough. I'm like, I need to start sharing the real truth that my, like, I think what was interesting to me is that my dad would give these really boastful and, 
and superhero like stories. Like he was just grandiose and great and a genius, a mastermind killer. When in actuality, he was a very insecure man who was terrified of things. And so, like, it's just, you know, when I watch TikTok and they say, oh, that's that, they have that tech, TikTok trend. Oh, that's the remix one. Mm-hmm. I always think, like, that's kind of what my experience with my dad is like, oh, that's the remix version of the story. But, um, mm-hmm. but I feel like the victims deserved to to hear him not I think somebody I, I believe the victims deserve to hear him be put on notice that he's I mean he was just going around there saying how great he was and how powerful he was when when in actuality he was not he was a very weak man even though he's six foot six he's not he's not what he's portraying himself to be and that seems kind of typical with a lot mm-hmm. of grandiose narcissists I found like when we read about these cases. So that's really interesting too. Um, Ageless Beauty wants to know, would you ever interview your dad and have you ever confronted him? And if not about, you know, would you ever? Yeah, actually um, what just happened recently was that in April, my mom passed away and so grief is a funny, weird thing. And so I started to think about my dad more and about his life. And I was curious more about his childhood. So I wrote him a letter and I gave him my phone number. And this summer he called me and um, I did have a conversation with him. And But only one conversation. I ended up not continuing to talk to him. And um, it, was a, it was an interesting conversation. I'll say that for sure. Very interesting. He did end it with, um, he's very upset that I am not with him, but against him. He wants me to be on his side and do his bidding and, and be his spokesperson for the media. And, um, that's not, you know, obviously what I want to do. I have no desire for that. And then he's upset that I, I really don't take the claim that I'm just his daughter and that he made me, you know, and that my career is because of him. It's not because of him. There's a million other things that I've done that are unique to my experience that have nothing to do with my dad. Um, And so, but he doesn't get that. Like to him in 1995, when he was arrested, I was, a teenager. So to him, I'm probably still that 16 year old girl that he can say whatever gaslight me, but that's not the case. And then he ended the phone call with, um, goodbye, my daughter. Like he like was affirmative, like goodbye, you're my daughter, whether you want to be my daughter or not, you're my daughter. And I'm claiming you as my daughter. And that was the tone. And, and afterwards I thought, you know, I'm really proud actually of what I've created for my life and for my children and my home and for him to try to take credit for that means that I must have done something really good. And, and, and that's really what I took away from it. Mm -hmm. And is that the one you were referring to on uh, your podcast? You talked about, he had tried to call you on Father's Day, I think you said. Yeah. yeah. Was that that was after that? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I was listening to that earlier. All right. So they're asking, um, being a truck driver makes it harder as they travel to so many places. Did your dad have a steady route or did he travel all over the US? He mostly had a steady route from he did more of the highway four oh five five where he would go from Washington through Oregon to um, San Diego, like all the way down the Pacific States. Mm -hmm. And then once in a while, he would take a load to Florida through Wyoming, like through the Midwest. But that was rare. Uh, He but he was normally hauling produce for grocery stores between, you know, Washington and California, because a lot of the produce was coming from California up to Washington State. And he had victims right in California, possibly one in Wyoming, if I remember correctly, and then Florida. Correct. So most of his victims were along the 405 five route. Mm -hmm. And then um, he had that one route where he picked up um, 
He picked up one of the victims, Angela Sabrese from Spokane. After visiting us kids, he picked up Angela and ended up taking her and dumping her body in Wyoming. Um, so that I would say that was probably the more abnormal circumstance because mm -hmm. that wasn't his normal route, you know. Another member question that came up was, have you reached out to other adult children of high profile murderers since it's such a unique experience? Yeah, I've been in touch with uh, most of the most notorious cases. We've all been in contact with each other and some stay private for different reasons than, and then some people, you know, have come forward. Mm-hmm. Um, were you relieved when you had the PET scan? Did it change your outlook on life? Yeah, I think it was just nice um, to have scientific proof that because of the question that everybody kept asking me, do, are you worried about genetics? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't feel like the PET scan is everything because I think it's still science to be discovered what makes a serial killer. But I do know my character and I know that I don't have any of the tendencies that um, I have no desire to kill, but if anything, it's the opposite. So it I wasn't worried, but it was just nice to have that one scientific proof like, hey, this I'm not I'm not like my dad, at least in one more way biologically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I could see um, why you would want that. I do love your positivity and the way your outlook is on everything. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I think that, um, I think that's the only thing that really got me to survive through all of this is just mm -hmm. it's really about your perspective and how you reframe what happens to you, you know, um, at least that's what I found to be the trick in dealing with yeah. difficult problems and circumstances from small to big is, just if I change my perspective or my point of view of it, maybe I'll see it differently. And Jax wants to know if he would act differently after he had just um, killed someone. Well, I think it was just overall the um, more unhinged, something seething below the surface was just a constant presence. It, it wasn't like a fluctuation. It was very steady. Or, or I would say steady and escalating. Yeah, she definitely is. Pink Dahlia, she's definitely strong. Yeah, I really admire it. I, I think it's cool. Anytime you can take a situation, like I can't imagine what you've you know been through, but turning it into something good, turning it into helping other people and educating other people, I really admire that. Well, I appreciate it. I think that... Um, for me, it was just about, I think it's just, I think it's for a lot of people actually, when something senseless happens in their lives, they want to, they want to take that experience and, and turn it into something not senseless, you know, something meaningful, whether, I mean, I'm not, I am not one to say it was God's will, God's plan. Cause I don't believe it was God's will for my dad to be a serial killer. And mm -hmm. I think we have these sayings that work, I think, for grief. I don't know if they actually work for grief, really, but where people will say, like, well, God wanted this person back or God, you know, and I just, when it comes to faith and these murders, I don't believe any of the murders had it coming to them or it was their fate or they deserved it in any way because I don't, I truly don't believe that. I think this was something my father manifested and wanted and, um, and he made that happen. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's, I think the cruelty of life is that, and I think that's what makes also people have um, different variations of post-traumatic stress is like your life could be normal one minute. And because of the choice of someone else is just completely switched mm -hmm. and that people have that kind of control in your circumstances to do that to you. And I forgot Melissa B had had this question. Um, we were talking about this the other day. Have you ever been tempted to go back and look and see if there were more missing women in that time period along the routes that he would take to see if maybe well, there, there, there are, there are a lot of cases. The issue is, is just tying them to my dad. I mean, there's like, there's, 
as you know, working in true crime, you need, you need DNA, you need all, but their bodies in the desert would be so badly decomposed. There's just no way to prove it. You know, that my dad was the killer on some of these cases, unless he was giving more explicit details. Um, and he picked women who were vulnerable women in society. They were transient themselves too, or come from broken homes and lives. And so unfortunately, um, they really weren't accounted for in the same way as people who weren't as transient per se, you know, per se. Yeah. And I guess you can only speak from your experience, but Scorpion asks if there's mm -hmm. ever been a serial killer, um, having a child who became a serial killer themselves. No, I haven't heard of any case. Like I've never heard of a serial killer begetting a serial killer. Like it's like, I've never heard of it yet. Yet. Um, I'm sure there probably is one in history, you know, because there's so many humans and I mean, serial killers have gone back way before we started documenting them. I know I've, I've talked to different professors who have spoken to me about native American serial killers. Um, I mean, it's, it, it's not a new thing. And let it be summer asked, did it take you a long time to get to the strong place that you're in? Absolutely. Because yeah. it really tore my identity because if, you know, what's wrong with me if, my dad is this way, you know, as a, as a young woman, it was shaping my identity. And then I felt a lot of shame for what he did. And I internalized that and I felt ashamed of myself. And then there was this part of me that went through a phase where I didn't feel like I was entitled to be happy because, you know, he took people's lives and I can't be happy because that would be a slap in the face to the victims. But then I started to dissect it and realize my dad and me are two separate entities. I didn't commit the crimes. I can be happy. I can laugh. I can joke. I can even have dark humor and make really off color jokes because that's, you know, obviously not the victim's expense, but when you deal with this kind of trauma, you have to make fun of it. And, and so, you know, privately, yeah, do I joke about a smiley face? Yeah, I do. But, you know, like mm -hmm. there's moments where I laugh about it because it's so absurd. But I want to make the distinction that I'm never laughing at the victims. I'm laughing at the ridiculousness of my life with my dad and my dad and who he is in general, you know. And I'm laughing at the happy face, the weirdness of that you know, and how now it's become like a normal thing in, in our, well, it's always been a normal thing in our world, but for me, it's a weird dynamic because you're never going to see artwork on my wall with a happy face on it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there was one point that, that I laughed about because it was so crazy. I was texting Don and I was going to, and we were like, kind of like, haha, laughing, texting each other. And then I was going to send him a happy face. <laughs> emoji and I was like I can't send him I can't send him a smiley face emoji <laughs> like no nope, not that one but yeah um, just so then I did the kitty cat one yeah. the kitty cat smiley face <laughs> and then my daughter's like don't send the cats that's a different nope. meaning <laughs> I don't know what the meaning of the cats ones are like I'm in my 40s I guess I'm I'm out of touch, but my daughter was like, don't send the cat. <laughs> no, I think we can all relate to that because we're, we're the same way when we're in true crime all the time. We're talking about it all the time. We have to have dark humor. And that's, we have, that's one of the questions coming in because you are talking about such dark topics all the time. You have to, yeah. and it's never, yeah. Yeah. And it's part of our family too. I mean, there's nobody really talks about it. And so it was, this is actually sad. But to give like another context of it, um, <laughs> this is really sad, but um, my cousin had committed suicide after going, she was a doctor and she was in this long marriage and she found out her husband was having an affair with a, a nurse and he ended up getting her pregnant. And then um, it was three years ago, she ended up um, killing herself and it was so devastating it was absolutely devastating to lose her. And 
And then we go to try to find something for the funeral to bring. And all they had was smiley face cookies. And <laughs> I was just like, my sister looked at me and she was like, should we bring these? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, but I mean, like, but that's how we dealt with the sorrow of, of my cousin's death. And then just being in the, the family dynamic again, my dad's side of the family again. And, um, and then part of what we're really laughing at is just how ridiculous my dad has made our internal family dynamic you know, that this is the elephant in the room that we don't talk to each other about with my aunts and uncles. And, and there's also resentment and tension about how we've all dealt with it. You know, so my sister's been private and then here I've been public. And so some family members are like, don't agree with that. They live in a small town. They just want this to like be forgotten about, but they keep forgetting that I'm not the one drumming this up. Like I'm not putting this in the media. This has already been in the media. I'm just adding another voice to, to this so that people could really understand the impact. Mm -hmm. You said something um, on one of the interviews and this kind of ties in with Rhonda's question. She's asking how your father's prison record is. You said that you thought if he got out, you'd think he would kill again. Um, why do you think that? Yeah, because um, in prison they don't get they don't get therapy, they don't get um, any mental help, any rehabilitation. Um, mm -hmm. There, he he hasn't dealt with the core of what those impulses came from. You know, the power and control he hasn't. If anything, prison probably has just promoted it because of the toxic nature of that environment. But there's no way he's gotten treatment to be productive in society. I wouldn't trust it, at least. I mean, there's wow. even therapy for rehabilitating um, domestic violence perpetrators and it's just not even been effective with that. So, I mean, if, I mean, we could dive into that another <laughs> really yeah. deep, but there's just the prison yeah. system's broken and mm -hmm. it's not, it's not helping. Um, well, first of all, my dad's a violent offender, so that's another level, but it's broken for even non-violent offenders. Mm -hmm. Well, so you've got all this positive stuff that you're doing and is there anything you can think of? I was thinking about this today, getting ready. That's been a challenge. That's a constant challenge for you or anything at all that you deal with that you don't think, you know, other people would because of this. Um, that's a good question. Um, I would say the biggest hurdle that I dealt with is what I said before, which is trying to find my place in this world as, because at, at the beginning, I really thought people would look at me and say, oh, you're responsible to, you know, because the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You're in that same place. And so you're not really worthy of having a great life. And I mean, I would say that was in my 20s. And, and having that mentality, that not worthy mentality really brought about even more difficult challenges. I dated toxic men. I, I was a codependent. I believed that somebody else was smarter or more capable than me to direct me in my life. And it really didn't come until I started to realize my own identity and who I wanted to be. I think that's what really helped me is to, to shape in my mind a vision of who do I want to become and live up to that person. So I ended up kind of to, to make it more tangible for me. I would actually take character traits or, or appearance things and just kind of mishmash and make like a, a vision board in my head of this woman I wanted to become. And I started very young. I actually have a picture of me ripping these things out in, as a teenager, but I really pictured before when I was a teenager, I pictured the power suit, you know, and like, um, Legally Blonde came out and uh -huh. <laughs> like, so it was like the power suit. <laughs> so I pictured 
this version of me in a power suit and I was like, like I was doing things I had control, I had power over my life and that's where I started. And then I started to build on that about character values that I wanted to have. Like I want people to trust me. I want, um, I want to have this part of, you know, I want to be feminine. I want to have a beautiful house. I want, so I just started to craft that. And I realized, you know, you can be who you want to be. It's not set in stone. You can create who you want to be. I love that. Yeah. And you've accomplished a lot. And so Chrissy, you bring up a good point too. And yes, we're all, we all are so impressed by your strength. It's incredible. And could you tell us a little bit about what you're doing? I mean, the, anything that you have in the pipeline that you can talk about or. Yeah. So it was announced with. today that CBS picked up happy face to make into a TV series. So they're going to start casting and start filming in Canada here soon. And um, so it'll be a TV series and it's basically about um, my dad's cases and how I work through them and working with crime survivors. Um, so there's that. And then I'm working with Gypsy Rose. I've been um, interviewing her for several months and we're working on a multi hour documentary series that will be coming out here soon and a book. Um, so I'm helping her write her book, her story in her own words, because there's so much to share. And what else am I working? I'm working on an international black widow case where I'm working with the daughter of um, a woman that, killed her husband's and her daughter stepped forward to be a whistleblower and is being charged with one of the murders. And so that's an active case right now. So I'm working on that. And, um, yeah, I have a couple other cases, but I'm very, I pick and choose the cases that I'm really passionate about and I dive fully wholeheartedly into them and try to develop them into, some kind of platform. I think actually one of the cases I'm working on right now, I'm trying to make it into happy face season three. So I've reached out to iHeart. I brought this case to them about a woman who was kidnapped by a serial killer and raised by his family. And oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I would love to have her on season three and to follow her journey. So I just submitted that to iHeart this last week. So hopefully fingers crossed that will go. Oh, wow. You are busy. Yeah. <laughs> so interesting though. And I can't wait to hear the gypsy rose too. Yeah. Um, and we'll take this one last question before we wrap up. Uh, HS beauty says, can you describe the day your dad got arrested? Yeah, it was actually, Oh, it, it, it was in the spring of 1995. I was a, in high school and what was really sad uh, before the day that I got arrested, my, my dad got arrested, I should say, um, I was in an abusive relationship and I had just found out that I was pregnant by this horrible guy that I was dating. And that's in happy face, actually. I just realized I interviewed him in happy face. Um, and I talk about, I ended up choosing to have an abortion, but I was in this dilemma and then I come home from high school and I see the news and I thought I saw like somebody who looked similar to my dad. And then, um, but obviously you don't think that it would be your dad on TV, you know? Um, anyway, so I go downstairs, put my backpack on the cot and my mom calls all three of us kids to meet, which is rare. And she says, your dad has been arrested for murder. And my brother asked, yeah. you know, like the details and she wouldn't, she didn't give it to us. So, so we ended up finding out as everybody else found out the details. Yeah. Oh, so it was just kind of left like that. And then you guys had to watch. Yeah. And then the next day we just went to school, like nothing happened, you know, it was, it was crazy. And, the, but in the moment, you know, obviously I cared that my father was arrested for murder, but, we didn't know it was for serial murder at first. We, we knew it was for murder and then it could have been accidental at that time. You know, mm -hmm. we didn't know he's six foot six. Did he accidentally kill a man? Um, we didn't know anything. So it could have been completely accidental and, but it obviously turned out to be different, you know? 
Yeah. yeah. And then imagine going back to school with that being on the news. That had to be interesting. Yeah, that's when my friends um, at lunch, we used to all sit together and they said that their parents had saw what happened on the news and they didn't want them to their kids to be around me. And I think it's just because they were afraid that I would share probably something that they didn't want their kids to hear, or I don't know, like who, who knows, but um, they hung out with me anyway, but it was not, I was not welcomed at their, their homes anymore. Um, so I think that's where a lot of the shame came from too, is through that experience mm -hmm. of, of feeling guilty by association. Right. And that was a huge, a huge thing I had to work through. Well, you've worked through so much and are doing so much. And again, I was telling you before the show, but everyone was so excited to have you on oh. and <laughs> hear your story. Well, that's amazing. I think it's uh, it's weird being in this bubble because, um, you know, with COVID, I haven't been around anybody that I don't know, you know, and nobody mm -hmm. really comes up to me and starts talking about it what will happen in public is sometimes somebody will will look at me and recognize me or mm -hmm. one time I was at the restaurant with my family and the waiter waitress said I know who you are <laughs> and then I was like okay cool mm -hmm. <laughs> like, and then my kids are like that was weird <laughs> That's so awkward. No, you are. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. There, but, I, yeah i wouldn't know how to answer that all the time too yes yeah yeah so. <laughs> yeah and then this morning at starbucks i got my my coffee and the lady out the window is like i love your podcast <laughs> the barista mm -hmm. i was like okay cool yeah. thanks <laughs> well it takes a lot of courage to just talk about such personal experiences and helping others so Thank you. Yeah. Very honored to have you on. And again, for those of you who weren't on the beginning and or the front end of the interview, I do have uh, the link to Melissa's podcast and a couple of her books in the description below. I've been listening to it. I personally love her podcast, so I would highly recommend that you go check that out. And, you know, like I said, we geek out of this stuff. So hopefully we can have you on another time or yeah, it'll be fun. I'm just oh. reading the comments. So if my eyes are wondering, because I'm like reading, oh, yeah. this is uh, Tom Melissa to grab a drink and invite her to join everyone on True Crime and Wine. Oh, yeah. well, like I got a, my beer tonight. I'm just chilling. I'm going to need to have a chat with Melissa about this casting for the show. I'll have to read it later. Well, I get to read these later. The, yes. the Okay. Yes. Yeah. All of these comments um, will be in there. That you can read mm -hmm. after too, but yeah, because yeah. we are actually that's a good point. You should just grab your beer and come because we have after these on Wednesdays, we have true crime and wine, and it's like a it's a member thing only. We were talking about that before, where mm -hmm. we just you know have a couple drinks and talk about true, true crime, so it's fun. Yeah, super um, sounds like oh, and Jeanette, I want I didn't want to miss yours. I think her answer, I think she said earlier that he hasn't, but I. I'll make sure that's correct. Has he ever asked for forgiveness from you? Oh, no. No. Um, would... No. He wrote some interesting letters, though, this summer. Um, I think the, the one thing that he did say that was interesting to me is um, that, you know, he didn't leave me with anything. And so I had to forge my own way in this world. And... And I think that's like the most he's ever acknowledged my experience is just that statement, you know, that he mm -hmm. sees that he didn't leave me with anything. I'm like, okay, well, that's good that you at least see that. <laughs> like, <laughs> you actually left me with less than that, but okay, that's a start. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, and I, yeah, well, because you described him earlier, you know, as a narcissist, I would see, you know, that because that would require him taking accountability and taking blame. And yeah, that's not what he's going to do. So no, no, he really was hoping that we'd have like a family reunion in prison that would bring my kids and that everything would be forgotten about. And yeah, I was like, Oh, that's interesting. You know? Mm -hmm. And then he had a lady call me this summer to do the lifers banquet. Like that's a whole nother story. <laughs> like, <laughs> the lifers banquet? 
Yeah, we there's a lot of banquet. Where are we so going? there's a big barbecue year in the summer and where all the lifers have a barbecue and they get to invite one person and they it's the lifers banquet. And so, <laughs> yeah. So this um, other inmate's daughter, um, I guess my dad had reached out to her and asked for advice on how to manipulate me to go to this banquet. <laughs> and so she was calling mm -hmm. me. So I got this number that I didn't recognize. And I answer, I never answer my phone for numbers that I don't recognize. And she introduced herself and she said that her dad's an inmate and uh, is friends with my dad in prison and that my dad really admires their relationship as a father and daughter and asked if I would go to the banquet because it would mean so much to my dad if I, if I came and I was like, no, I'm not planning on going. And <laughs> wow. Yeah, it spooked my kids. They're really nervous because there's, um, my dad got my sister's address. He had somebody on the outside find her and oh, go to her house. So it's, you know, it, it's really, there's a false sense of security thinking he's in prison that he can't do anything. And, um, but he really has people on the outside who will do his bidding and, I don't think anybody has the motivation to cause bodily harm to me, but mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't put that out in the universe. You know, I just, I know that's a reality, but it really spooked my kids, you know? Yeah. And so for a while there, they just didn't want to be alone at the house after that lady called. Cause of, and, and after that happened to my sister, cause it happened about back to back. And so they were scared that they, you know, they call him Keith. They were scared that Keith was going to have somebody come here. Yeah. Oh, I could yeah. definitely do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there anything else? I know there's so many questions and I was even filtering through them <laughs> for anything else that before I know you've been so patient and good with, you know, oh, and all these questions and I just love your honesty about everything. Uh, well, I guess something that's been, um, that I've been doing for several years, I'm working on my third book with random house, but I help other survivors write their, their books. And so I've been doing this for years and helping other women get their book deals. And so I'm going to do a retreat in Morocco this summer, a writing mm -hmm. retreat. And I just went last summer to Morocco, Marrakesh to scout out the location and, um, but it'll be in July and it's a full week in Morocco and I'm only inviting 10 women and doing this writing retreat. It'll be a creative retreat. We'll be riding camels in the desert. We'll be doing fun stuff, going to the souks. Um, yeah, it'll be fun. So oh, awesome. if that appeals to anybody in this group and they want to, they want to join me, then they definitely can message me on Facebook. Um, and I'll give them the details or just, they can, yeah. Connect with me <laughs> on Instagram. Or, yeah. Awesome. That sounds like Melissa B is already probably like, um, I'm going. No, that sounds really fun. It was a blast. I went, um, I had it pre-planned before COVID and it was totally booked out as a retreat. And then because of COVID happened, I refunded everybody's money. And mm -hmm. then um, I ended up the owner of the retreat center. I didn't want to take my money out when everybody needed the funds. And so I just asked her to, comp me that for the, when I could come. And so I made it my own trip to scout it out and, and test out the experiences that I wanted the ladies to have. And I'm so glad I did because it was a wonderful experience. And now I can curate the retreat even better, you know? Wow. That sounds amazing. Yeah. yeah. Do you go to crime con every year? Or I, I did this last year. year. I went this last yeah. year. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm going to go to Vegas as well. This, um, May. I think it's May. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Which I'm definitely going and yeah, I'm trying to get my team to go too. Um, oh yeah. I think that'll be a blast. But you haven't? Okay. It's super mm -hmm. fun. It's really fun. Yeah. I'm definitely going to that. Um, and it was so, oh yeah, they had last year's, but the one before that was canceled. Right. I believe right. it was. They, yeah. they pulled this last one pretty fast because of COVID was, you know, obviously it's still a thing, but having gatherings, you know, conferences was a new thing, like how to do that. Yeah. And they had it in Texas. Um, 
and it was it was great. Yeah, it was actually weird. That was my first experience being around that many people, <laughs> and I didn't realize how sheltered and and you know, <laughs> yeah, I was had anxiety about being around people, not because I was scared of them. I was just like just being around that much energy, that amount of people was just yeah. uh, something I wasn't used to. Yeah. yeah. I know. I think we were all like that after we came out of our caves. It was. Yeah. Was a little weird. like, <laughs> yeah, it feels, yeah, like it was weird. <laughs> um, oh, it'll be fun. Cause yeah, I'm, I've been bugging my team to go to. So. No, absolutely. Go. I think Vegas is going to be even bigger and better than mm -hmm. any of them. So. That'd be fun. Well, thank you so much for coming tonight. Like I said, um, hopefully we can have you back on and talk about more stuff um, in the future. That'd be awesome. That'd be great. Thank you guys. Uh, this was really fun. I just got to have a beer and chat with you. It's good. <laughs> this is not like my regular job. <laughs> no. I'm not going to have any wine yet. So if you want, I'm sure Melissa has it. If you want to come and join us afterwards for this or pop in for a minute, um, I'll have Melissa send you the link and you're more than welcome. It's because it's really fun, you know, especially hour two. Oh. Um, so we've had a couple, but yeah. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah. So I'll have her tell you that too. But, and thank you to my amazing mods and everyone that asked questions and was here to listen to Melissa's interview tonight. And if you enjoy our content, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe, and share this interview with your friends. So thank you guys until next time. Stay safe and have a good night.